welcome to the TTS Talking Empowering Early Years Education webinar. So throughout this session, a panel of experts will be exploring ways that we can overcome the challenges that are facing early years practitioners. But also we're going to be discussing opportunities to redefine the future of childcare. My name is Alistair Bryce Clegg. I'm an early years specialist and consultant, and tonight I am your webinar host. So we all know that having a well-motivated, well-supported and knowledgeable workforce within the early years is key to supporting child development and children's well-being. But yet, despite its real importance, the early years workforce in the UK continues to face a multitude of challenges, including things like really high workloads, very low pay, limited opportunities for training and career progression, and just a general lack of funding that's available across the whole sector. So although such challenges were visible pre-pandemic, it goes without saying that COVID-19 has exacerbated many of those issues and that we need to act now if we want to project the future of our early years education and recognise its real importance. So today our discussion is going to focus on how can we empower early years practitioners and recognise the importance of the work that they do every single day. We're going to be asking the key question, how can we overcome the challenges facing early years practitioners and change the future of childcare? And our aim is to offer you some guidance, some information and some inspiration that you can take away and put into practice tomorrow. I am really excited to say that joining me today to talk about this incredibly important issue, we've got four early years experts who are going to be bringing their experience, insights and understanding of the sector to help us to make a real difference. So I am delighted to welcome June O'Sullivan, MBE. So June is the CEO and creator of the UK's leading childcare social enterprise, the London Early Years Foundation. June has developed the London Early Years Foundation pedagogy and champions community-based multi-generational early years education as the basis for greater social and cultural capital to deliver long-term social impact. And June remains a tireless campaigner for children, families and the early years community. So we're incredibly excited to have her as part of this discussion. Lovely to see you, June. Thank you very much for that very effusive welcome. <laughs> we're also joined by Thinima Tanuku, OBE. Panima is the CEO of the National Day Nurses Association, which many of you will know by its acronym NDNA which is an award-winning charity and a membership association. So the NDNA are the voice of a 24,000 strong nursery sector, and also they are an integral part of the lives of more than a million young children and their families. And Panema also represents the sector to government ministers, parliamentarians, civil servants, the media and local authorities. She's a very busy lady, so I'm glad you had time to join us, Panema. Thank you, Alistair, glad to be here. So we've also got Jamel Carly Campbell on today's panel. Jamel is an early years educator, consultant and children's author. Jamel is passionate about the early years and stresses the importance of having a balanced, diverse, inclusive workforce, curriculum and pedagogy. He's partnered with Mighty, which is Men in the Early Years, which is associated with the Fatherhood Institute and has assisted the London Early Years Foundation with extensive research about the effect of having men as part of the early years workforce. Good to have you here, Jamel. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And finally, we're joined by Kate Moxley. So Kate is a consultant, trainer, speaker and author of a best-selling book, A Guide to Mental Health, the EYE, which was published in May as part of the Routledge Little Minds Matter series. And what Kate's book does is it amplifies the voices of educators and their lived experience and what it's like to work in the sector. It raises real awareness around mental health and putting well-being at the heart of early years pedagogy. Good to see you, Kate. Thank you for having me. Excited for our conversation. So it's a big welcome to our fantastic panel of esteemed guests. And I think a really good place to start is by asking for you in your roles, working with practitioners in various different forms on a regular basis. When we talk about the challenges that the early years sector are facing at the moment, what do you see those challenges actually as being? June, if we could start with you. For me, it's the recruitment of staff and the retention of staff and the challenge for them of 
trying to balance keeping quality at the heart of everything they do for the children. Um, right now, we have, we've never seen the uh, retention and recruitment problems that we have now. Never have been in all my years in this, in this world have they been quite so bad. There are many reasons for them, which I, I no doubt we'll talk about later. But for me, it really is. How do you attract? How do you retain? And how do you, how do you support so they want to stay? the best quality staff and and do it in a way that gives them the ability confidence and the well-being to deliver quality to the children consistently and i think a real key part of that is when you go to work you want there will, there will always be challenges about being at work but you've got to love being at work and i think if you invest your time as well in working with early years you're working with children who are at the very beginning of their journey and they are really developing all of those social emotional your know, mental health hopefully strategies that will keep them going for the rest of their lives. But that also can be really taxing on the adults who are working with them because they need a lot of support and a lot of kind of coaching. Is that something, Jamal, that you found in kind of your role as a practitioner? That there's a lot of support needed and a lot of the staff on the ground are, are really feeling the pressure. Um, I call it the domino effect, you know, where members of staff are like they end up being ill and um, the rest of the team are, are having to take the pressure. Also, when members of staff leave, um, the rest of the team have to take the pressure, you know? So if you've had, for instance, 18 key children, you know, a member of staff leaves and you, you're the buddy to that person's key children, you then have to take on, you know, the key children to make sure that they've got the best support um, and the learning is kept consistent. And not only that, when you take on new members of staff, um, you have to then train them, support them, because then they have to take on, you know, the workload. So, yeah. And Kate, in terms of your training, the work that you do with practitioners, are you finding there's a, what is the need? What are people asking for? And when you're actually working with practitioners, what are you finding in terms of what they think they need and actually what you're seeing in terms of what the need actually is? My response links to both what June and Jamel have said there around um, the impact of the retention and recruitment crisis and how that is affecting not just obviously, um, you know, um, the practice within the setting day to day. It's also then the knock on effect of what's happening in terms of um, of COVID. So COVID hasn't gone away either. So some of the retention and recruitment crisis in, in the settings and educators that I've worked with is that many redundancies were made during COVID. And now we've got back to a place where actually settings are busier than they perhaps were before. They haven't been able to you know, replace the staff that were made redundant. And so as, as Jamel and June are both saying, they're talking about the quality, how are we supporting staff so that they, they stay? The, the problem that we're finding is, is that um, you know, staff are, that their health and well-being is affected by the pressures within the, the daily role. So that stress that affects us, we know that emotions are contagious. We know stress is contagious. So it, it, it goes hand in hand. And so being able to, I suppose, focus on staff well-being from a starting point is going to have numerous benefits, um, you know, for the team ultimately, but for the children as well, because we're not gonna solve the retention and recruitment overnight. So, you know, how are we gonna take care of each other? Um, so that, as you say, those workplaces are enjoyable spaces to be in. We spend a lot of time there, don't we? So we, we wanna enjoy the people we're with and those spaces that we're occupying. I think it, and very much it's about that, when in your own head and your own mental health, if you're under a lot of stress, then you, invariably take that into the workplace in some way shape or form and even if not consciously subconsciously so I was working with some practitioners the other day and again it'd be interesting your view on this Panema who were just basically saying this is all well and good but nobody's listening we keep saying the same thing again and again we say it on blogs we say it on forums but nobody who's got the power to make the change is listening so is that a truth in terms of the work that you've done? Are you finding that people who could make the changes like government, are they listening? And if they're not, what can we do to try and effectively get their ear? And the major issue we have is all the political turmoil that we're in. The minute they start making some sense and listening to us, they're moving on. So the kind of consistency that our practitioners and our childcare providers are giving to children and families 
we don't have that consistency at their political level. And I think that is the biggest challenge. You know, sometimes, you know, people like me think, oh, here we go again, you know, because we have to make new relationships with the political leaders. We have to start that conversations all over again. And I think that's the biggest challenge. But having said that, you know, looking at it positively, you know, the sector has faced several challenges because some of the challenges that we have now have been there for a long time. And uh, some of them haven't been addressed, and you're absolutely right, because politically, that should have been the priority. But the COVID has actually exacerbated those situations, you know, the workforce recruitment issues. We've been talking to DFE for more than five years because the level three qualifications, people with level three were dropping, and the levels of qualif qualified people, levels of people want to enter into childcare is dropping. And something should have been done at that time. But, you know, uh, the sector has kind of, you know, carried on. And, uh, and, and provide that high quality, even under the most difficult circumstances. And I think that is something that we should be celebrating as well. Absolutely. I think there are lots of elements that we will hopefully pull out of this that we can celebrate. And if anything, we are the most resilient workforce that I have ever come across. And I think, again, partly if you're working with children, flexibility uh, needs to be part of your DNA because no two days are the same. So we are a flexible workforce, but there is a point where you become flexible to a point where eventually you're going to break you can only flex kind of so much so in terms of that recruitment issue because there was a time when recruitment wasn't as big an issue i'm talking about quite a significant time ago and it was quite aspirational to come into this kind of professional work with children what is it that actually you think what are the key factors or features of our profession at the moment that are making people not want to come and work in this space going back to the good old days, we had real investment into, into workforce and qualifications. You know, we had uh, support and funding to, for people to acquire level threes and support for, uh, you know, uh, professional development. And there was a clear workforce strategy, but that's not there anymore. You know, we don't, we have a workforce strategy, but it's absolutely, you know, not worth the paper that's written on. So I think, you know, what we really need is a comprehensive review because over the years, uh, the kind of successive governments have kind of, you know, built up a system, sticking plasters on a system that is A, not fit for purpose and B, not working. And yeah, that's what we've done over the years. And I think that's why somebody needs to be brave enough to be able to open that can of worms, take that lid off and look at what do we mean by childcare in this country? What do we mean by having a highly skilled, highly qualified workforce in this country? What do we mean by you know, education? Putting children at the heart of it, that's what needs to be done, a full comprehensive review, uh, especially at a time where we're facing all these challenges. And it was hoped, I think, at one point that COVID might have been the break that allowed that to happen. The fact that something monumental occurred that would have given us an opportunity to say, right, let's resort and look at what works and look at what doesn't. But I think you're right. The government has a bit of an agenda in terms of catch up culture. So, again, a lot of early years educators will talk about the pressure they've got from other people further up the academic chain that are asking them to catch up when actually what we should be doing is meeting children where they are and going on that journey with them. Mm. So Jamel, in terms of you being a practitioner still in your space, for you and the people that you work with, what are those big challenges? And is there anything that you are doing to overcome those within this, the space that you work in? There are so many layers. There's so many layers to the challenges that we face on the ground. Um, in terms of well-being, it's just creating that whole family environment, you know, and making sure that we're in touch with the community. Um, and, you know, we know what's going on. And we, we just have that, that level of empathy. Because often, like, people can, can be from a certain demographic and look upon things like, you know, it doesn't affect me, it doesn't affect us. But really and truly, you know, going through COVID, it has shown that, you know, we've all been affected in such a deep way, but the after effects for particular communities, you know, has, has been slightly different um, where some, some parents, you know, due to not having work, are not able to put their children in nurseries. So they've had to wait and then send their, their children to school and such. Um, and, and that's even with, you know, colleagues. Colleagues are not able to send their children um, to school 
So what's happening is they're having to cut their days and that then affects, you know, what's going on within the nursery in terms of the workforce and, and ratio and such, you know. So it's just really about having an understanding, having that empathy that things are not the same and things will never be the same. But also thinking about what do we do next? How do we move on from this? And how do we create an environment that benefits us all? And that's in and that's on all levels. That's from the top tier, the mid tier, and those that are working on the ground. You know, how do we build up an understanding um, that helps to empower, you know, our our leaders, empower our workforce, and ensure that you know we're all singing off the same hymn sheet? Because if we have a conversation you know, you, you'll see that everyone's got a different perspective and view on what's going on and, and how it affects them. And I think a different perspective and view can be a healthy thing. I think what we need to engender a real culture of is the fact that it's a respectful expressing of that view, but also having a strategy that's based on research and science. And also, you know, as Kate talks about in her book, that kind of lived experience of the practitioner, because you can't get away from what you are experiencing on the shop floor, as it were, on a day to day basis. So we've got a kind of cost of living crisis at the moment, which is obviously affecting the whole of society in lots of different ways. But as you're saying there, Jamel, people who maybe could have afforded some childcare, even in terms of staff, are not being able to do that anymore. And also coming into the workspace with those added pressures post COVID of this cost of living crisis. So all of that is impacting on the provision we can offer to children, but also the well-being of the practitioners that we've got in the space. Yeah. In terms of your experience, June, have you come across anything like this? Is this what you're seeing? We have about 820 staff and well-being is a big issue for us. In fact, we wrote a book about it at Christmas just to really give them some strategies because we can talk about this in terms of the abstract, but actually what people want a lot of is what things can they actually do to make adjustments. And so when we did an analysis with the staff, we did the staff survey and we recently had the staff conference, the um, kind of emerging picture from the staff is about status. It's about what is the value of the work we do? And we do things ourselves that don't help. So for example, we don't really make clear to parents the very important, valuable, well-researched role of early intervention and the power of uh, early education and care for, for their children in relation to, the, you know, the, just sort of setting them on a pathway for both life experience and ed educational benefits. We don't really have major narrative around that. We don't do big campaigns around that. We don't really celebrate enough publicly so people understand. So I think that's one thing we could do really is to, to, to get parents to understand more about the issues. We kind of cracked that a little bit during COVID. And I think a lot of us were quite positive that actually finally parents began to see the benefits. You know, they were talking to us about I had no idea. For example, I had no idea that little two year olds need their friends in nursery. So many parents said that to me. I, I never thought of that he needed his friends, but he actually really needed his friends and he missed them. And I wouldn't have thought about that. Many parents said, oh, we just didn't recognize just how much you do in the day with the children in terms of supporting their development. Um, now that they're home with us, we begin to realize that. So there was a there was the emerging sort of positive um, and, and kind of um, celebratory kind of narrative about what it is the early years is is for and what does it do in relation to supporting society and that we need to do something more about that we need to bring that back in we need to pull together and we need to have a bigger argument and a bigger discussion about what that means for parents i think that then impacts on staff staff talk a lot about feeling the status is not recognized again um putting this point about training so important and a lot of training has been limited or it's been, been on zoom or it hasn't happened for a lot of places and i think that's been quite um, debilitating actually in terms of people's sense of self and self sense of confidence but also we use language like practitioner educator we're actually early years teachers in the proper way and we've never really owned that and when i changed uh, leaf 2017 to leaf teachers um honestly the motivation and the status amongst the staff and the parents was really it was really sort of heartening and it wasn't linked to their qualifications. People have different qualifications, but the role they have is to teach. And whether you're a baby or whether you're a four year old, you're still teaching and care is part of teaching. So I think there are some small things we can do 
that actually have a big impact because otherwise we'll be and I think Jamal makes a really good point about this we'll get very depressed by the whole thing we'll be very we'll only see the negative and therefore we won't be able to move on we actually need to see the positives because in the meantime there's 25,000 nurseries uh, we have four and a half thousand children every week so you have to also celebrate what we can do and what we do well and what we're strong at and you know and the roles we have to support that so i think we have to be careful that we don't overwhelm people with just all this kind of negativity and this kind of um kind of sort of deficit kind of approach to things which actually has in itself a negative impact so myself are really keen that we we did lots of singing and lots of joyfulness and lots of um kind of you know build up kind of activities and lots of uh, celebration that actually what they are doing, despite the really big challenges that they're operating in, is a difference. And, and they get that and they sort of know that you are actually making a significant difference to that child. And for some children, and I think, again, Jamal makes reference to this, and we know this a lot because we work in a large number of, of communities that are really challenged uh, economically, uh, is that, you know, you are often the, the, a very important person in that child's life. And I think it's about the celebration of that as well, despite the kind of difficulties that the entire sector is experiencing. And you're right, all of those things can really work towards building up people's view of the job that they do. Nobody who works with early years children can doubt the importance of the job that you do because you're doing it on a daily basis. But I think, yeah, that kind of mechanisms we can have to have the sector be recognized both within the sector and outside of the sector mm -hmm. consistently would be really useful. Mm -hmm. It's about strategy, about how we bring that quite big piece of work to fruition, not impossible, but challenging. But in the meantime, I think also empowering, you know, if we're talking about nurseries, nursery group owners, to also share those thoughts, that information, and have a cohesive view around what they can do to empower their workforce. As owners and managers, they're worried about their own businesses. They're wanting to make sure that whether the, the kind of books balance at the end of the day. I received so many calls from owners, um, you know, not only just during COVID. I mean, I remember one particular conversation, somebody who's been in the business for 30 years, and she had three nurseries and they were all struggling like everybody else. And she said to me, but I've decided I am exiting the sector uh, because I don't want to have a heart attack or a stroke at this point in my life because I've come to that stage now. So you can understand how difficult it is for leaders to keep going, keep their staff motivated and make sure at the end of the day, they're delivering quality, but actually the business is sustainable as well. Yeah. So I think there is definitely a gap because you know that what people say about is lowly at the top kind of thing. That applies to a lot of uh, uh, leaders and owners and managers in the sector because we're always kind of trying to do our best for our own staff to keep them going. But I think we need to sometimes take a step back and look after ourselves and make sure that actually I need a breather. You know, I need to do something positive, something to keep my batteries recharged. I think that's equally important. But sometimes I think we forget that. That's really important that we need to look after ourselves before we even talk about looking after our staff. Absolutely. I, I was just going to jump in there and just add, um, you know, we're not just a workforce that um, has, has not been taught about mental health and well-being. We come from a, depending on which generation, a generation where we, we, we've never been taught about mental health or well-being. And so a lot of the work I do when I'm speaking with practitioners, we, okay, what have you ever been taught about well-being throughout your lifetime? What have you been taught about mental health? What conversations have you ever had? We're, we're walking around pretending that, um, you know, one in four people or one in six people in the workplace aren't living with mental illness. We're also working with colleagues with physical um, health conditions, disabilities, and we just want to pretend that we're all the same. And actually, mm. as we've kind of referred to, COVID, it gave us all permission to feel. We all discovered that the people, the colleagues that we worked with were all experiencing different things. And it gave us a, perhaps a renewed empathy um, because nothing throughout my career in 25 years of working with children has ever been about me as an educator and my health it's always been about safeguarding and protecting children but yet if I'm not healthy and well enough to be at work um but I'm showing up at work yeah and I'm not 
you know fit enough to be there and how many of us have had sick days when we probably shouldn't have gone into work but ratios and you know responsibilities we don't want to let people down and we go in anyway and we do it we know that the cost of presenteeism yeah has more of an impact on our economy so that's people showing up to work being unwell than absenteeism does and so you know I again that deficit language around you know what is going to be the impact of on children's health and well-being and lifelong development if they're being cared for by educators who are unwell but actually we need to have a conversation around normalizing it's okay to not be okay it's okay to show up at work and not be okay but knowing that the people that I have chosen to work with within this organization have got my back and I they'll do the right thing by me so like as you were saying before you know again when I started my qualifications years and years ago now I was just grateful to get a job um you know and that conversation at the end why do you want to work here I was always trying to rack my brains and now I'm trying to empower educators to you know there's a difference between belonging somewhere and trying to fit in and so why are we taking our knowledge and expertise into an organization if they don't value staff well-being so it's changing that focus to look at this strategy and what it's going to be like moving forward We've also got to get political and we've got to understand, have conversations with business leaders, owners, managers. And how, like we've all we've always been taught, oh, we shouldn't talk about politics. But actually, again, we've got to engage and empower educators and ourselves to have these meaningful conversations locally, nationally, that can lead to change when it comes to funding with regard to our sector and all the, the things that June and Panima and Jamel have said so far. So there's so many things that we kind of can do. And I think that it, you know, in terms of a strategy of, of like moving forward, it's got to start with honouring care and modelling care as educators. So when June was talking about those um, strategies and things they do, um, actually, if we don't model and honour care as adults, as educators, then so often those little moments in the day when we're taking care of children, they have actually become the most stressful parts of the day, like snack and meal times and nappy times, because we're trying to do all the things for other people. We're trying to squeeze too much in. What would happen if we just, you know, focused on those, those rituals and those moments that honour self-care and compassion? And it's that reciprocal process because we know it's intrinsically linked. So, yeah, I'll probably come back to you here, Alice, or I'll continue talking for another 10 yeah. hours. But it's just yes. so, there's so much here to... Yeah, to and your passion is great and very valid. And also it's making me think about what Jamel said in terms of that sense of belonging within the team. So trying to create a space where you belong to the tribe that you work in who are realistic. And I think you're dead right, Kate. Certainly when I first started in early years education, there was no discussion at all around adult mental health in fact mental health to be fair wasn't something that you talked about in any way shape or form so the idea of having that as part of who you were as your ethos within your setting was was remote and I think hopefully what I am seeing is that is getting better but are there any things you do Jamel in your setting particularly that you think help engender that culture of your belonging as opposed to just a space where you come to work with people that you quite like most of the time? Well, do you know what? Um, just building those positive relationships, you know, understanding who your team are, who these individuals are, and, you know, just doing the little things like buying a bowl of fruit, like satsumas and bananas and bottles of water, you know, making sure, have you had a drink of water? Just looking out for each other. Um, I recently... Um, Read a book with Sonia Maidstone all about positive relationships. And it's all about, it's part of the mini um, Little Minds Matters series as well. And um, it's our August 18th little plug. It's all about like relationships between staff, relationships with us and the children and relationships with our families as well, because they can tell when something's off between the team. You know, it's been a little tiff, a little argument. Um, they can tell. And if they can tell, the children can definitely tell. And what we're doing is, is creating a knock-on effect that's going to affect the way they are, their behaviours and how they manage their, themselves and how they self-regulate and such, you know. Um, and I think positive relationships is overlooked because even if you look at the wider sector, the whole sector, you know, there's so many divisions. There's so many divisions. We don't show enough love. We don't show enough love. EY love is important. 
Yeah. And if we're not showing love as a sector, then why do we expect the government and all these other agencies and companies, whatever, to respect us for what we do? We need to respect each other. You know, it's not I'm Leaf or I'm Zoom or Bright Horizons or Caster Bridge or whoever, whoever you are. No, we, we're early years, you know, and together as a sector, we make it great. And it's about promoting that practice and promoting all the great things that we do, all the great papers and research and blogs. And, you know, there's just so many amazing things, books, videos on siren films and such. You know, there's, there's, there's so much going on. And that way, you know, when, when we're, we create a, a, a space of love, we're then going to inspire others that view our sector to join our sector. We're going to inspire those that didn't know that this kind of work was going on. We're going to inspire so many people. We'll inspire those in the higher tiers of, of the education sector, be it primary, secondary and such, and be like, you know what? The foundation is def the foundation stage is definitely the foundation stage because it gets overlooked. And when I'm speaking to my teacher pals and I'm like, look, you know that the early years is the foundation for all learning. I don't care about your PGCE. You know what I mean? You lot don't know about child development. You don't know about A, B and Z. And they're like, no, that's the first thing we learn on our course. But it kind of gets lost along the way. You understand? So we need to go back to basics and show EY love, you know. I think, yeah, you, you're dead right. And I think we are a vast sector and we are a passionate sector. And with a lot of those passion, or with a lot of that passion, sometimes comes difference of opinion. But like we said earlier, it's okay to have a difference of opinion. And actually, sometimes from that difference of opinion arises some really good thinking. But you are dead right. It can sometimes become very divisive. And I think social media can be an amazing tool for sharing, but it can also be an amazing tool for shaming. Or you flick through your Instagram and wonder why you haven't got a hula hoop covered in hessian hanging from your ceiling with some fairy lights and some plastic ivy on it. And does that make you a worse practitioner because you haven't got one or a better one because you have? And so I think there's a lot of internal self-shaming goes on when people are looking at what they have not. And it's sometimes it's about trying to say, well, never mind about that. Let's look at what you have and what you possess inside and the relationship you have with children. But again, it's vast, isn't it? So it's about how we as a sector can try and facilitate that positive change and have that cohesive respect for each other. And that really, as you're saying, Jamel, would leak out and show that actually as a sector, we might have differences of opinion, we have differences of thought, but we pull together because ultimately we're all in it for the same. Exactly. Thing. And can I just add, that's why my book's so amazing because it's a conversation <laughs> between myself and Sonia Maidstone, who's a, a white lady from Bath, and I'm a black man from inner city, London. And it's so beautiful because there's so much things that we agree on. And we developed such a wonderful relationship, you know, her talking about swimming and myself talking about music and museums and writing. And do you know what I mean? And it's just, it's just lovely when you have two different people from two different walks of life um, that just love, you know, the same thing, which is the early years. We're all teachers. So whenever you have an interaction with a child in any way, shape or form, there is usually some teaching involved in that somewhere, whether it's verbal teaching, non-verbal teaching. So we have one thing in common, which is that, and also our passion for the sector. And you have to be passionate about it, otherwise you, you wouldn't work within it. Um, so... It's trying to go back to our fundamentals, I think, and try and look beyond the distractions. I'm just wondering, Panema, from your point of view, is there, even through the work that NDNA do, how could we do what Jamel is talking about as a sector and try and be more cohesive in our approach right across the board? You know, from what June was saying before, and, and, and Jamal and, and Kate as well, there are some positives, you know, we, we, we kind of talk about the negatives in terms of COVID, but there are lots of positives that we've actually been able to unearth, really, you know, in terms of what's been happening, because, uh, you know, there is a newfound respect uh, you know, for childcare uh, sector. And of course, you know, we call it practitioners or teachers, whatever parents do understand because especially during COVID when they're working from home with children at home and having to do the, their job 
and they really, really realized how important role that the nurseries and childcare providers played. I think that was one thing that we need to really uh, kind of use that as a positive. The other thing, of course, is media. I mean, I remember going back a few years ago when the 30 hours policy started, media didn't really understand. They really didn't get it. But having said that, they do now. They really understand in terms of what we're talking about, cost of childcare, why there, there is an issue in terms of, uh, uh, you know, funding and all the underfunding issues. But I think what we need to do that is actually turn the flip the coin around, really, because, you know, that's why we started our uh, campaign, a year long campaign, totally non-political. What we wanted to do is not only raise that public awareness, because as a society, we need to understand the value of early education, mm -hmm. because, you know, you still get people, oh, well, you know, why should they, the state pay for mm -hmm. childcare? Why should the government pay if you got children you should do it yourself you hear that all the time so there has to be an understanding as a society as a whole this is an important part of a child's life this is where we need to invest this is what we need to shout about so starting from politicians uh, from all parties across uk to parents and of course the, the kind of people that we want to encourage them to come into the sector. Yes, it's low pay. Yes, it's hard work. By, by, by the way, the difference that you make in a child's life lasts for a lifetime. I think those are the messages that we are trying to get across to our campaign. And we had 27,000 signups already for the campaign, which is absolutely fantastic. So this is what we're pushing for, to turn the negatives into a positive and to say to people, respect the sector, respect the people who work within it. But government, by the way, politicians of all colors and all shapes and sizes, respect the sector, make sure that you give the right investment that is desperately needed. But also to say to people, come and join us, is a fantastic sector to work in. And where could people find out more about that campaign, Panim, if they wanted we to? We can put the link into the campaign. And, uh, you know, so like I said, you know, it's, it's going absolutely brilliantly. So uh, if anybody hasn't signed up to it, sign up to it, because it's a pledge that we want to keep going across UK to really shout out loud and clear. And I would say, you know, as as you know, people who work in the earlier sector, it's important to make our voices heard. And sometimes you can think, well, my little voice that won't count for very much, but actually it counts for an awful lot. And even recently when they talked about reducing ratios, oh. uh, the media headlines were how the new government initiative will save you money on your childcare. Oh, well, it may save you money on your childcare, but it will cost on the care of your children. So again, if there's an opportunity that you see to be able to have your voice heard, even though you might think it's one small voice, it does make a massive difference. The government currently is spending £1.5 million on promoting tax-free childcare uh, because, you know, parents should access it and there's £2.4 billion underspend in tax-free childcare. Yeah. That should really come back into childcare funding to be able to, uh, you know, have the sector sustainably deliver that high quality. But we have been talking about a workforce strategy in for years when I approached DFE about this and nothing has happened. So we thought, well, you know what? If they don't do it, we're going to do it. And that's why our board decided to actually put the money into an investment into that. And, you know, talking about recruiting teachers, there's been huge television campaigns mm. and uh, golden handshakes for people to join teaching, you know? Why aren't we looking at things like that for the earlier sector? Those are the questions that we're asking the government. And I think that's where we need to really flip the coin. Start at the bottom, not at the top. Yeah. But Pranima, don't you think that takes us back to the, the point about voice? Because everyone on this panel so far has talked about voice and coherence and bringing the voice. So every tiny voice brings in a, a louder noise. There's nothing new in any of the stuff that any of us are saying here. We've been sort of arguing for this for a very long time because it's obvious, to, it's obvious as the nose on our faces that it's important to invest in the early years and what we do. So how do, um, I guess, how do we empower uh, what, you know, a young apprentice who doesn't think that they have anything to offer at all? So it's something about how we, um, create a kind of a, a national narrative around the importance of what we do in a positive way. I think the problem we often face is that the perception we have is of negativity and it's failing and it's doom and it's never enough funding. All is true. 
we know about the funding, the, you know, the ratio fight. But when we do pull together around a particular issue like the ratios, we cohered very well. And actually, we, re we got it, uh, you know, we got it rejected. And hopefully this time we'll get it rejected again. But I think it's something about the power of the voice. It goes back to your point, Alistair, about how do you, how do people, what do we do to help people to give them a voice? And I think it's really interesting also Kate's comment about politics, because actually um, I've always taken the, art, the, the, the view that working in early years is a political move, because if you find yourself you're not just dealing with the child's education. We are dealing with food banks. We are dealing with child obesity. We are dealing with safeguarding issues of children who are neglected. We are dealing with uh, parents with no money. We are dealing with all sorts of things. So the minute you touch the life of one child, you start to touch the bigger political issues. You start to look at housing. Why aren't our staff being given key, you know, key housing? Why do I have to fight for my staff to get on a housing waiting list because they're not teachers? You know, those kind of things matter, I think. And it's about where do we have those debates in a positive way? Because when we have them on Twitter, or I only do Twitter, so I don't know about Instagrams and all that, but, you know, they're often not, and there's not enough of a debate room. 140 characters doesn't give you enough to get it going. So I think there's something about us becoming confident about what we know about ourselves and confident about what we know about the sector and bringing those voices together in a way that's coherent. And I don't think we can do that till we all agree what we understand by education for small children and where there are some variations in that thinking. And so a national conversation and indeed a national strategy, we haven't had a national strategy since 2007, is really an important way of beginning to build that conversation. And then I think we have an opportunity to then, you know, negotiate with the government because it's not about the government doing to us it's about also also negotiating with them and i understand the frustration because um we've had i think 15 or i don't know 15 or 16 proponema will know this 16 um you know uh, secretary of states for child care or the varying names that they have but you know so i think there's something about how do we do that and how do we do that in a positive structured and strong way so that as you join the sector you also join almost that voice so I, I think it's really interesting and I, I'm hoping people who listen to this webinar will actually feed in some of their ideas to do that and to capture on that so that actually we do use things to to navigate a really positive and clear and um, and agreed, you know, understanding of what we mean by early years, which I know is very contested in terms of academics, but there is a central agreement about what we what we mean for a child then you're also taking to the policymakers the science and research and experience mm -hmm. of the people who are knowledgeable about early mm -hmm. years. But as we know, I mean, any government policy is not purely based on the science and the knowledge. There's lots of, of economics that are obviously involved in that. But if, at least if you felt you were a stakeholder within the decision-making mm -hmm. process, then I think that would bring a lot more credibility to the sector. What we really need to, to look at is, you know, like I said before, as part of that comprehensive strategy, that a, a blueprint for childcare. I know ministers go and visit other countries and we've always <laughs> said, you know, it's not a comparison with like with like, but we need to look at ourselves and say, what do we need as UK in this country for a, a child, starting from pre-birth to, to going up to school and what have you. And it's a blueprint of what we would like to see. And, and and we need to come up with that blueprint ourselves. What do we mean by regulation? What do we mean by government funded childcare? Because it's not free childcare, it never has been, and it never will be. And I think, you know, all those issues that we need to set up our own blueprint uh, together to be able to influence politicians. Because at the end of the day, you know, during elections time or pre-elections time, the focus is always on parents. And, and you know, parents as voters, 
But I think what we need to, that's part of the reason why we want to reach parents with this campaign, because they need to understand the intricacies of how childcare and the system works within the country. They know what they're able to access in terms of what they're entitled to. Not all parents do. And that's why we have got so many underspends in so many different areas of the childcare funding. But I think, you know, that's the kind of dialogue that we want to have. And we've already started that modeling and we're working on those things. But I think it's, you know, the kind of the, the life of a minister or the life, you know, time of a minister or a politician during the last three years has kind of been condensed into a few months. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we have. And uh, But, you know, hopefully we will make them listen and we will continue with that fight. And I think that's where the resilience comes from the, within the sector, because we are passionate people, absolutely no doubt. And uh, yes, we may not agree with uh, everything with each other because put three or four earliest uh, experts or practitioners or whoever in one room, we will end up disagreeing on a number of things. But the way to look at it is from a child's perspective. And I think that's really important. Yeah, I think fundamentally there's always agreement that what you're striving for is the best outcomes for children. It's how the, the best way to achieve those is. So I think from what I'm hearing, there's obviously a quite a high level political strategy around what we want child development to look like in the UK. But I think there's also a level of early years practice and what that might look like because I visit lots and lots of settings and still see quite a diverse range of practice, but also expectations of practice. So, and I look at the workload that some people have in terms of even now what's expected around their day-to-day care of children in terms of record keeping and reporting and all that kind of thing. And that in itself, even though we've got legislation in place to try and reduce that through Ofsted, but still there is quite a lot of expectation. Obviously we have to be accountable because we are dealing with small children who are really important, but I think there could even be more parity around shared pedagogy around what effective early years practice can look like with babies, two-year-olds, toddlers, whatever it may be. I don't know whether Kate and Jamel, you see any of that in where you are in the work that you do. As I said before, it's all about community and I think understanding culture as well. Um, and then basing that understanding, you know, that child-centered approach on your, on and, and marrying it with your 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 process of teaching you know so understanding that all right um this particular child um is Ghanaian they're into construction and design and pattern making understanding what kente cloth is you know just and and engaging having that dialogue you know with the families um and 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 making that that connection and I think something's the key thing that um Panima said was about the power the power of the people you know we're passionate you know, so if we can do that from the ground up, you know, then it can have a knock, knock on effect, you know, and, and our families will see that that passion and then our families will spread the word. Um, and it makes me actually think about the, the, the overall sector, the fact that it's so cosmopolitan, right? And you've got different people from different walks of life. And often within the sector, that is not seen, you know, through our trainers, our consultants, CEOs and such, even in, you know, the, the um, our exec, you know, a line of execs in a lot of companies, you know, it's not diverse. Um, and even when literature and books are written and stuff like that, you know, it's not reflected. So when the community is not seeing people holding those spaces, they look at the industry or the sector as a joke, like, right, this doesn't represent me. I have nothing to do with it. And then a distance is made. You know, um, instead of them wanting to, how do you say, be curious and, and OK, they're talking about something that we know from our culture and mm-hmm. such. Hence why myself and a few of my early years colleagues made the EY Blacklist, which is a directory of um, Black or Afro-Caribbean um, professionals in EY, um, often books about inclusion or often um, talks are done about inclusion or, and there's boards made about inclusion and diversity and culture, and there's not a single black person on those panels. So, and often the excuse is that they don't know any professionals or any people at that level that can speak on these things. Could be outdoor play, could be about anything, yeah. mud kitcheners and such, whatever. So we created a list for the sector that has loads of people. So check it out, the EY Blacklist, yeah. um, blessings to Laura 
um, Henry Allen, blessings to Liz Pemberton and Joss, you know, um, Cambridge Simmons, we put that list together. So it's about connection. And if we make that connection, as I keep on saying, um, and then we speak and we shout, all those tiny voices, like June said, will make a loud noise. But we can't do that if we're not doing, you know, the basics in terms of representation and the basics in terms of uh, making those connections with our community. Because once we've got the parents on side, like we've got a wide and large workforce, but we've got the families on side and the community on side, then we're a force to be reckoned with. And the government has no choice but to listen to us. And in terms of well-being for all of us, it's yes. good to see you yourself or your culture being represented within the sector. It was, One it really million good. percent. And in different spaces, yeah. different spaces, because men, um, a guy called Chad Etiembo, he wrote um, a, a paper um, and it was all about black people working in white spaces, yeah? And it said that, like, black men in early years only make up, I think it's something like 0.3% of the sector. And from the research that I've done with June, you know, men in the early years sector only make up around about 4 or 5%. I don't know if it's gone up, June, since we done that research. It was lower than that, Jamal. It was 2% and it's not gone up much at all. But at least I'm pleased to tell you it's 11.6% because our work continues. But yes, really? you're right. It's horrifically low. Yeah, so it's still, do you know what I mean? And, and that's years, years and years and years, you know. 10, as, ten yeah. years, Jamal, 10, ten years. years. Ten and that's years. about changing Great. the culture, isn't it? Changing the yeah. culture of the space. And also, as we started the very beginning of this webinar, talking about the fact that if you're an outside uh, looking in, you want to be able to see yourself represented within that space, but also the space needs to offer you something that's exciting. You know, it, it needs to, you know, as we talked at the beginning, there's underfunding, it's, it can be low salary, it can be long hours. It's a very difficult job. It's a very, very rewarding job. But then I think as we've picked up, as we've talked, lots of aspects of that, some that we have got um, not a huge amount of control over, but we can have our voices heard and some things that we can have lots of control over. So I think, it might be worth just having a think at this point about, we've talked about kind of government strategy. We've talked about even having a sector-wide strategy about childcare and development, and we can be voices within that. But on a day-to-day -day basis, when you're coming into that space where we've talked about the community and the tribe and that sense of belonging, and I really like that idea that you are in your workspace, you belong to a team. So it is almost like having a family, but a family at work. Are there any, and I don't mean quick as in terms of sticking plaster, but are there any simple strategies? Like Jamel was talking about, you know, making sure everybody's okay in terms of food and, and water and that kind of thing. Is there anything else that we've come across either at a business level, so a more strategic management level or, or a, on the grassroots level, uh, things that we could suggest that people could have a look at that would really support that kind of development of the mental health and well-being of the space? I think there have been some great examples, Alistair, and that's what we were trying to promote it through our uh, bulletins and our uh, magazines as well, uh, asking people, you know, what are the things that you're doing? Because sometimes, you know, people think that they're doing it all. Well, this is nothing new. Everybody else is probably doing it as well. So I don't want to really talk about that. But actually, some of them were so creative. You know, people created buddy systems because people were working, you know, remotely, some of them, and some people were coming into work and also little gifts you know sending little things by post during COVID time to their staff and you know staff who are not well or staff who've been coming in for example at NDNA because we we're all office-based staff and we have remote staff you know across the, the country and we made sure when we had staff meetings I was absolutely conscious that people working from home on Zoom, you can't see people's expressions. You can't see if anybody is feeling a bit low or even feeling really excited about some good news, you know. And I insisted everybody that they switch on their cameras because it's really important, especially we had some new staff coming in during that time who have never met with anybody because we were all working from home. So we made sure that cameras were on, people introduced themselves and people set up buddy systems to talk to each other. We allowed time for people to do that, extra time 
after work to be able to socialize even on zoom so little things some nurseries have come back and told us about some wonderful things that they have done in terms of their staff how they were actually making sure not only they are physically and mentally well but actually looking at rotors to make sure some staff are not doing too many hours and making sure that their family commitments actually work with that and making sure they're also working flexibly as well so some wonderful examples have come out as part of that great yeah. i think i would add here that you know since we saw the introduction of well-being within the um, education inspection framework back in 2019 and let's pick back up on the point earlier about how much investment there is to recruit early years teachers in comparison to the investment in early years educators it there's such a disparity and a number of years ago if you looked into um, or tried to look into staff well-being in early years education again there was a complete lack of void of of, of um, support for those working in, in early years and childcare. And we know that shifted and changed since we've seen the work, um, you know, that Offset have been doing with, you know, organisations such as yourselves and um, Early Years Alliance, etc. Um, but unfortunately, it's still completely um, disproportionate to the support and investment that's having, um, you know, in, in education and, and, and within teaching. And so actually, you know, we've talked about making a, a noise, you know, if we act like what we do makes a difference, then it absolutely will. And, you know, picking back up just briefly on those conversations about, you know, connecting with communities and parents, we've also got to connect with educators that see themselves represented in terms of like the opportunity to do this conversation for example for myself and Jamal you know we're previous um, and Jamal's still you know doing all the things working writing um, and whatever um, but to for educators who are working all of those hours day in and day out with children they want to hear someone that that you know that knows what it feels like they want to um you know be able to have a conversation and share something without feeling like um they can't be honest with how they feel about stuff and so since that education inspection framework and we saw well-being if you look across social media because june i'm on all social media channels <laughs> you see unfortunately just tick lists small gestures and the problem is is if the systems and structures don't have well-being at the heart, that don't truly have staff well-being at the heart, then those little moments, those, those chocolates, those face masks, those little bits and bobs, actually, they don't do anything. They can make things worse. So actually, when we show up in our workspaces, have we got line managers who have been trained to do supervisions and one-to-one -one discussions? If I go for a job interview, I, I, you know, are they asking me about my health and well-being? And actually, how are we prioritising our life outside of work and work-life balance? Because again, we know, you know, a huge part of this problem is our educators. Um, they are the ones that are facing that the, the, the cost of living crisis. They're the ones that are earning the minimum wage and fighting and having to, you know, do all the things for benefits and support within a workplace. We don't have unions. Not everywhere is afforded a union. Not everywhere is afforded employee assistance programs or investment into their health and well-being. So if we train our apprentices, if we change our training so that it starts to, you know, put certain things um, on the map, so that blueprint is about staff well-being and mental health. So that vision for the future is about building mentally healthy workplace communities. And that's got to start with inclusion. It's got to start with connection. It's got to start with belonging. And when those things happen, you you can look at what your protective factors are within your workplace and what things can threaten and risk it. And so picking up on what you said earlier, um, um, Alistair, about social media, I didn't have social media to look at as a professional development tool when I did my training. But certainly what happens is people go off on a tangent with it. So they look at someone's, you know, did you say a hula hoop with hessian on and twinkle lights and they go oh that'll be brilliant but actually what's that got to do with the group of children in my care what's that got to do with our philosophy our pedagogy and so often it's got nothing to do with it whatsoever and 
we are, and I was guilty of it as a manager. I was so committed to getting that Ofsted outstanding and, and for those local authorities and my head teacher to see how wonderful my team was and the quality of my provision, that I got sidetracked sometimes and I et slept, breathed my role. And what I really needed from my line managers at that time was to say, Kate, go home, mm-hmm. spend some time with your daughter. What are you doing to take care of yourself? And, and these are the things that we need to be having conversations about. These are those really important important things because this job when you work with children it becomes more than a job it becomes part of your life but we've got to we've got to get that balance right because actually it it shouldn't be everything it should be it's a big part of us but it's not all of who we are and so when we start to develop um I suppose that empathy that um, Jamal's talking about that emotional intelligence which is an absolute life skill and so many of us working with children are sensitive and empathetic but we've just never been taught how to use these superpowers and these skills then we create these workspaces with people where we can build our self-esteem our confidence we feel healthy and happier rather than feeling like what am I doing? Why am I working myself, you know, into the ground for a job um, that doesn't seem to value me? No, I value me. I value my health and I'm going to choose to work in a place that's going to value it as well. You know, I think there is a, there has been a real culture and it, of first to arrive, last to leave must be the better practitioner because you are obviously devoting yourself to the space. And I think hopefully we're all getting a little bit wiser about that, how that's not a great culture to be in. So kind of what I'm taking away from what you said, Kate, is that part of what you can do in a more strategic role is to look at all of your policy and procedure and ask yourself, where does diversity representation, but also mental health and well-being feature in the policies of and I know we can all have 300 policies that sit in the file on the shelf. You've, you know, a policy is not worth having unless it's lived, breathed, and exists within the space. So also it's about that, re-evaluating who you are as an institution, what you are, and how the policies you've got in the file actually apply to the people in the space. And then if that is in place, the layer that exists under that is that layer of the kind of thoughtfulness, the gifts, the hot chocolate, that kind of stuff. But it comes from a place of a firm foundation and commitment to well-being as opposed to a token just to try and get you over a hump with some potentially grumpy staff members. Yeah. Because then, then you, oh, sorry, Panima, I was just going to say, because then you also then get the managers, and, and as Panima mentioned earlier, the managers who are the ones doing these thoughtful gestures. But actually, who's then looking after them? Yeah. Actually, if they're not, sometimes wasting their time doing these smaller things and actually doing the more structural things that lead to change in terms of policy or being clear on what that vision is and not getting sidetracked then actually that will have an impact on them as well because you also see then managers going well I'm, I'm just what's the point of me doing all these things and it's a resentment resentment that goes around it's like a vicious circle of people feeling frustrated and not appreciated and that's that is such a shame when actually all everyone is always trying to do is put children at the heart of it um and so sorry Penny, I carry on I think uh, you know bringing back face-to-face events has helped enormously because we almost forgot about how we actually interacted face-to-face we were all zoomed out you know and I think you know one of the things that we we kind of did uh, during the pandemic you know we held all our events on zoom obviously um but then one I think you know Alistair is uh, is, is our guest at one of those events we thought that actually you know let's have an event just an evening to really for people to sit down with a glass of wine or a cup of tea or whatever to listen to somebody not rant about funding or workforce or recruitment or whatever we know that they're always there and we sort of held an event we had 700 people who joined that event and we called the evening with Alistair and uh, it was absolutely brilliant because we didn't talk about politics we didn't talk about anything else but just really purely inspirational and we started doing that kind of thing more now so we're doing one in scotland and wales and we're also hoping to to do one again this year as well so i think it's really important to kind of step back like i said before for those owners and managers and leaders to be able to sit back and just listen to somebody it could be somebody totally outside of the sector somebody who could really kind of lift that spirit and and really engage with people. 
I would agree with that. Um, last two weeks ago, we had our conference that again, we had 800 staff there and I got my choir master to come and they sang for most of the day. And we got a ro- lovely uh, bunch of young um, young Londoners called Drumworks. Superb. I saw that on people. social media. It was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, they were just, it was just, I just did not want them worrying about things and talking about big issues. I wanted them to have the nicest day and the happiest day. And music is a thing that boosts all of us. I have written a lot of books recently with nursery managers or with colleagues, and um, one on diversity and inclusion out this week, actually, with one of my lovely managers. But one of the things we wrote at Christmas was really about how do you build well-being into your daily work because what I was worried about is that people perceive well-being as going to the gym doing something after work but you're in work all day long you're in work 10 hours a day so what is it you do in the day and Kate's made some really relevant points about the structure of the day the the sense of leadership and I think leadership is something we need to talk about because Kind leadership, leadership that's empathetic, leadership that is built on emotional intelligence is super important. Um, But also, when you think about your arrival in the day and my leave teachers, when they come in, you know, the first thing you often do with the children, you settle with them, you have breakfast with them and that. But what is that's happening for them? That's good for them. That's good for you. Well, the first thing is that you have access to really good food. So the chef in your nursery is a really important member of the team. And we have done loads of training for our chefs and we've got an academy for chefs and everything else because it's such an important thing. So the first thing you can do as a as an owner or a manager or a leader of of nurseries is provide decent nice food for the children and the staff the second thing is when you're working out your day you know and you're developing your play-based pedagogy or whatever it is you do um, um then what activities are good for you that are good for the children so if you're outside and you're running around with the children that's good for your well-being it's good for your physical development when and you don't have to go to the gym if you've been outside a lot of the time with the day with the children, whether you're lying on the grass, listening to the leaves or whether you're rolling in in the fun or you're, you know, you're you're chasing them on their bikes, whatever it is you're doing. When you have your quiet time, we have yoga. We've had yoga for years at least, but it's not really proper yoga, but it's all about calming and breathing. We've trained the staff to enjoy that as well. So the experience the children are having, the staff are having as well, because the staff are always looking for good things to do with the children. But what we have to try and explain to them is, what you must make them good for you too. So you're not then under that horrible pressure. You've got to leave and do something. You've got to leave and run to the gym. You've got to go to your yoga class. You've got to try. It, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do those things, but it does mean that the experience of the day is completely interconnected with the experience you're having with the children. And that as organizers, owners, CEOs, whatever it is, leaders, we think about that in the way we support the pedagogy and we support the teachers to actually deliver that pedagogy. So I think there are some things that we can do that actually just reframe what we're currently doing in a way that's actually celebrating the uh, the joyfulness, I think. And we mustn't forget the joyfulness of the sector. And, you know, one of the things when we throughout lockdown, we ran 15 nursery hubs and there were 200 children across it, which was a tiny proportion, but I had 200 staff. And one of the things that they used to say to me, and I used to talk to them every day at three o'clock, was the calm, the quiet, the peace, the time to do stuff. They weren't, you didn't have to do all the things. You didn't have the huge numbers of children. You had beautiful ratios. Um, and so I think it's important to, to be able to give people the confidence to, to d- deliver their day in a way that celebrates what's good for them is also what's good for the children. And then the even better thing is then you drive it right out into the, into the home and into the community. So that actually you're then supporting parents to realize that just lying and having a laugh with your children and a belly laugh, watching some stupid thing on TV is as good for your mental health as it is for hers and for them at work. And it's just about giving permission about what kind of behaviors and what kind of things and experiences can you create with our not extra. They're all powerful in terms of what they do to support everybody's well-being and make people accept and understand the happiness of their experience, but also give them that resilience to manage the the difficulties that they also have to endure just in terms of our modern day life. Which I think is a brilliant point, really well made. And also 
unbelievably brings us to the end of our time on this webinar. In fact, we've gone a little bit over, but it was so good what we were talking about. It was worth staying on for. So I think my key takeaway from this, and there have been many, and I just love that last point you made, June, about the fact that if you can make your work part of your well-being, and again, that also takes some strategic planning from the people who are leading and managing the space that you work in, but also comes from you because you can make those moments to laugh and you can make those moments to you know, be at peace. But also, if you can get that you know, really great food because your chef's working well, all those things are really important. So... There are things you can do outside of your space that are about you and that idea that Kate said about focusing on you and your mental health because when you show up to work, you want to show up as your best version of yourself. The fact that Jamel talked about the idea of being in that community and belonging to the space that you go to, not just belonging with the children, those relationships you have, but also the parents and then the, also the staff that you work with. And then at a more strategic level, both June and Panima talked about making your voice heard and looking at campaigns like the NDNA one and you know, making sure that you do look at your policy and practice and make sure that mental health and well-being and representation is fed all the way through that. So there are bigger things that might take a little longer because we are trying to change culture, but they're all possible, especially given the passion of the workforce that we've got. And there are some smaller things that you could literally do on a day-to-day -day basis that might impact really well on you and the people that you work with. And ultimately, they should all produce much better outcomes in terms of both children and their families, those people that are the most important to everybody who's listened to this webinar. So all it leaves me to do at the moment is just to say thank you to you all for coming onto this webinar. Thank you to my guests for coming along and giving us their opinion. Literally, we probably, I know we often say this, but we probably could have still been here, you know, at midnight talking about the same thing. And um, if you want to find any more information about any of our guests, obviously we'll put that alongside this webinar, but you can also go and look them up on Google. I'm sure if we Googled any of you, we'd find some really, I was going to say some really interesting things, but I meant in a professional capacity, but yeah, <laughs> who knows. So thank you all for giving up your time. It's been really lovely to speak to you. And uh, let's go and make some positive changes to the sector, because if any sector can do it, we certainly can. So thank you so much for joining us this evening for the TTS Talking Empowering Early Years Education event. We know how important this subject is and really hope that you found this session useful and also inspiring. If you'd like to watch the webinar again and revisit some of the topics that we've discussed or even share it with your colleagues, you can do so by visiting the TTS World of Education website. And also TTS has been working with additional experts around this topic to bring you some new ideas and some further guidance and also some resources that will support some of the themes that we discussed throughout the webinar. So we will try our best to answer any questions that you've asked throughout this webinar. And plus, there'll also be a more insightful follow-up content coming soon. So you can find that on the TTS World of Education website. Thank you for watching. We would love to hear your thoughts on the discussion from this event. So please do share them by tagging us on the TTS social media channels. And that's at TTS Resources. Thanks again. And we do hope to see you soon.